NATO's new strategic concept, which was adopted at the Lisbon summit in November 2010, marks a significant breakthrough in NATO's involvement in what we call the new security challenges, issues like cyber uh, protection, cyber defense, uh, counter-terrorism, dealing with the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, or issues such as uh, energy security uh, and the environmental uh, consequences uh, of uh, uh, changing uh, security policy as well. Uh, so as a result uh, of this new approach to security, which is based uh, increasingly on notions of resilience, of, of prevention, of the ability to recover quickly, uh, a new division called the Emerging Security Challenges Division was established by the NATO Secretary General last year to implement uh, that part of the strategic concept which calls for NATO to become more relevant uh, and to add more value to international efforts uh, to deal with terrorism, cyber uh, attacks, uh, proliferation threats uh, and the like. Uh, so where are we after one year? Well, if I look very quickly at the different areas, uh, first of all, cyber, which I suppose has been the most uh, exponentially rapid growth area, uh, we have adopted uh, a new concept, a new cyber policy, and the NATO defence ministers meeting at Brussels this afternoon uh, will uh, uh, endorse uh, an action plan with a very large number of very concrete items to implement our new uh, cyber defence policy. Essentially, what does this mean? Well, first and foremost, we need to protect our own systems. Uh, and like with any major organisation, there are more and more of these information technology systems that we uh, rely upon, civilian, military. And of course, they are more and more interconnected with other organisations, uh, our partner countries, um, uh, 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 who uh, assist us in missions such as uh, Afghanistan. So there is more and more circuits, in fact, that you need to protect. And of course, uh, the weakest link is key here, because one country can be spending a lot of money, but if other allies are not uh, uh, adhering to the same standards, uh, then that effort by one country uh, is, is undermined as information rapidly goes out of national systems into NATO, NATO systems into national systems, etc. So our first duty here is to protect our own NATO systems by the end of next year, 2012, to have them all under the same uh, protective umbrella with better intrusion detection so we can pick up attacks earlier and respond uh, faster and NATO rapid response teams that can quickly be sent to any incident to evaluate the damage and quickly get vital services back up and running. But beyond protecting our own systems, we also see a, a role for NATO, along the lines I mentioned a moment ago, in helping all allies to achieve better cyber protection. Our centre of excellence for cyber defence in Estonia uh, already runs exercises, training courses, uh, lessons learned, best practices. So the information that one country uh, gathers on a major cyber attack is immediately shared with allies so that everybody can draw the consequences. And we aim over a period of time to have common standards uh, of protection, minimum standards, particularly to uh, protect uh, NATO uh, uh, circuits, when they link up with national circuits. That, that's absolutely uh, crucial. Uh, the second area uh, is counter-terrorism. And of course, uh, we have just uh, marked the 10th uh, anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. And I think it's been for many international organizations, as well as NATO, uh, a time of stock taking about what we got right, what maybe we didn't get right in our response to terrorism. Uh, post 9-11. Uh, uh, I think the consequences for NATO are, are clear. Uh, terrorism is going to be with us, regrettably, uh, even after NATO's mission in Afghanistan uh, will end, the ISAF mission in 2014. And despite the enormous success that the United States has had recently uh, in dismantling the Al-Qaeda uh, network, uh, uh, particularly uh, through uh, attacking uh, many of its uh, principal uh, leaders. But uh, terrorism is a very cheap, very easy, uh, very asymmetric uh, form of attack, uh, and therefore it's not likely to disappear. So NATO has to continue its efforts to be ready to uh, contribute. For example, our Defence Against Terrorism program of work, which our new division runs, uh, has identified 10 critical areas where allies can work together on technologies. 
uh, to help to defeat terrorism. For example, in dealing with the problem of explosive devices, improvised explosive devices, which are the main source of, uh, uh, of casualties among our soldiers in Afghanistan, or being able to detect suicide bombers, uh, even in mass transportation systems, uh, like the uh, uh, undergrounds or the metro systems. We have a program called Standex, uh, which will be tried out next year in the Paris and St. Petersburg uh, metros, precisely to be able to deal with the protection of mass transportation systems, or protecting harbors, uh, uh, for instance, or protecting helicopters and aircraft against rocket-propelled uh, grenades. So these are important uh, programs programs, uh, not only to assist NATO soldiers in operations, but also to protect our civilian populations uh, at uh, home. Energy security is another area where we're working very hard uh, on being able to uh, protect critical uh, infrastructure, particularly at sea, uh, which of course is much harder to do and requires a more multinational approach than when you're protecting that critical infrastructure uh, on uh, land. And then there's proliferation. Uh, which of course is not really a new security challenge, in fact it's a rather old security challenge, but it's certainly become more of a headache for NATO governments over the last few years. Uh, the Secretary General has calculated that 30 countries in the world now produce uh, ballistic missiles, uh, even if they are not yet tipped uh, with chemical, biological or, or nuclear uh, or warheads, uh, and even uh, non-state actors uh, such as Hertzbullah uh, in Lebanon are credited with 40,000 uh, 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 missiles. So this is a technology which will be increasingly accessible to uh, armed gangs or terrorist organisations and will no longer be exclusively the monopoly of, 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 of states. And therefore NATO needs uh, to uh, stay abreast of the danger that terrorists will acquire weapons of mass destruction uh, or uh, uh, that an increasing number of states will have missiles uh, where Europe, NATO Europe, or even the United States will be within uh, range. Uh, we need to step up our efforts in the field of uh, protection against chemical, biological, uh, nuclear attacks, uh, forensics, uh, medicine, uh, uh, and help to the civilian authorities to deal with the aftermath of such attacks. And uh, as many of you will know, because this has received a good deal of publicity, NATO decided also at the summit in Lisbon last year to build a ballistic missile defence system, a ballistic missile defence shield uh, in, in Europe uh, to provide our populations with protection. And the initial operating capability for that system uh, should be uh, ready in time for our next summit next May uh, in Chicago. So there's a, a lot of work going on there too. Finally, uh, one of the key conclusions uh, of our new strategic concept was that uh, NATO has to do a better job of anticipating crises. Uh, it's all very well to wait for the crisis to happen, to wait for everything to go wrong, uh, and then to be called in as the seventh cavalry, if you like, uh, uh, when all else has failed as, as an option of last uh, uh, resort. Uh, but that's never the best way to manage a, a crisis. Um, and of course, uh, with our defence budgets uh, now under severe stress uh, and going down, including in the United States, uh, military establishments being uh, cut back, uh, and the Libya operation showed that uh, uh, it's increasingly difficult to have uh, adequate numbers of the capabilities that you need uh, for missions. Uh, for example, in the case of Libya, precision guided munitions or air, uh, air to air refueling or uh, reconnaissance. Uh, we well know that uh, uh, our governments would uh, much prefer uh, crisis prevention as the cheaper option and the better option where it's available. So NATO has to step up political consultations among allies, not just on the crisis that exists, but the, the crisis that could be just around the corner, to see how, uh, using diplomatic political instruments, using our extensive network of partnerships, uh, we would be able uh, to prevent the crisis turning into a full-blown conflict. Uh, and this division, uh, the Emerging Security Challenges Division, uh, has a strategic uh, analysis capability which works on good intelligence sharing, good policy planning work uh, to feed political consultations among the Allies on potential crisis areas 
uh, in a way that can help NATO, not only NATO alone, but NATO together with the UN, together with the European Union, the OSCE, with other organisations, with our partners, uh, to see what we can do to head off the crisis before it happens. That certainly is a lesson from the Balkans in the 1990s, or more recently, Afghanistan and other uh, conflicts. So, in short, after one year, I think that we've achieved a lot, but uh, uh, these are all challenges which metamorphose rapidly. Look at cyber, the way it's uh, increased at uh, an exponential uh, rate. Um, we have to be as uh, agile uh, at adapting uh, as the uh, terrorists uh, are uh, to our own uh, uh, tactics. Uh, and already, just to end, uh, I think we can draw certain lessons for the future. Uh, the first one, of course, is that within our member states, these issues are not handled only or even primarily uh, by defence ministries or foreign ministries, which are NATO's traditional interlocutors. Uh, cyber is often handled uh, by the police, the intelligence community, the business community, uh, uh, of course, because most cyber is in the civilian and organised crime uh, uh, domain. Uh, and therefore, NATO needs to have relations with these other branches of government if it's to be able uh, to come up with concrete uh, activities. So we need to sort of change to some degree the way we do business uh, because the way you handle uh, a, a military program like missile defence where NATO is very much in the lead is very different from the way you handle something like cyber or terrorism where NATO has a contribution to make but other organisations are also very, if not even more, I I I I important. So that's the first conclusion uh, that uh, I, I, I draw. The second uh, is to very much identify where NATO can add value. These are very large domains. If you look at cyber, you can look at it from the point of view of uh, you know, the, the policing of the internet or protection of uh, privacy on the internet or norms and standards for international cooperation or you can look at it from the point of view of uh, defending uh, your systems against attack. So again, NATO has to define very carefully where uh, we have the uh, resources, uh, the mandate uh, to play uh, a role. But of course, that means that where we stop, other organisations have to take over as part of a seamless approach. So uh, the ability to have that form of international cooperation with the UN, the EU, the Council of Europe, OSCE, this is going to be, I think, uh, also uh, very uh, important uh, for the future. Third, finally, uh, we have to put these new security challenges not in this new division alone, but in NATO, at the very heart of, uh, of, of NATO. The NATO of the future has to be as comfortable talking about cyber uh, as in the past, uh, back in the old days of the Cold War, NATO ambassadors were comfortable talking about tanks or uh, circular error probables of nuclear weapons or, or, or throw weights or, or, or whatever. In other words, NATO has to be as able to manage a cyber crisis today as 30 years ago it exercised and prepared to manage uh, a nuclear crisis or a major uh, conventional uh, uh, war. Um, so we've lots of challenges ahead, uh, but all I can say is it certainly is not boring. Thank you.